know the best thing would be to go and do some exercise, but uh, we don't want to miss this presentation. Uh, it is going to be about the food addiction. Uh, for those of you who are for the first time who were not here in the morning, uh, Dr. Eddie Ramirez, he's outdoor researcher working with the lifestyle uh, medicine for many of years, traveling around doing research and outdoor and co-outdoor on many books. And we are so glad, actually, we are privileged, I am privileged that in his busy schedule he was able to squeeze us to be with us here. Uh, so let us listen carefully. If you have any question from this morning, last night presentation, at the end of presentation we are going to have Q&A session so you would be able to ask all the questions that you have. Uh, without anything else, Dr. Reddy Ramirez. Thank you, thank you. Before I study medicine, I study computer science. So um, one of my uh, uh, things that I discovered recently, I uh, discovered a way of coloring all pictures. This is actually my uh, ancestors. Uh, he is my great uh, grandfather, and this is my grandfather. And um, look at how it looks after being colorized. Man, it just comes alive, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a totally different photograph. Look at this one. You know, they're very. Uh, old and uh, faded, look at with color, you know, boom, you know, it comes alive. It's an algorithm of uh, artificial intelligence. It figures out, you know, what is clothes, what is uh, skin, and then depending on the pixels, uh, tries to figure out the color that was there. Look at this one, very plain, black and white, boom. Another one. Another one, boom, <laughs> very nice. So that's what we're gonna see today. We're gonna try to see things from a different light, okay? That's exactly what we are gonna learn today. So we're gonna talk about a hot topic today, which is food addictions. There's some people that say, doctor, I know I shouldn't be eating this, but I'm addicted to it, you know? <laughs> I have to eat it, you know? <laughs> Well, not necessarily. You don't have to. We're going to learn about those addictions, why some people are more prone to that, and also we'll be talking about some strategies. What can we do about it to conquer them? Let me show you an interesting study that, uh, that I did recently. One of our patients that came to our New Star program. This is Wimar up in Northern California where the Lifestyle Center is located. Beautiful. We have these big pine trees and many, many trails where our patients go and do their exercise, fresh air up there in the mountains, 45 minutes out of Sacramento. And um, overlooking the Sierra Mountains in the horizon, you can see those Sierra Mountains and plenty of pine trees are around us. And by using, you know, uh, therapeutic interventions such as nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, temperance, fresh air, rest, and trust, we help people regain their health. And this, um, this study, you can find it there on my research gate. Remember, just type those three words, Francisco Ramirez Research Gate. They were asking me again about the Twitter page. This is a Twitter page. Just, if you don't even have a Twitter account, just put that in your browser and you will see what it is. Just twitter.com slash A-D-R-D-M-D, no spaces, and you will see that, that page there. And also the YouTube page, dradiramirez.com. And also, you know, I travel all over the world and I'm seeing different things. If you want to see those things, uh, you go to that Twitter, Instagram page, you know, that's where I put the photos of all these things that I am seeing. So 
the clinical case I'm about to share with you is found on that research gate. I have it there. That um, study came out in a journal from the American Heart Association called Atherosclerosis, Thrombosis, and Vascular um, Biology. So it's this patient that came to us. He had some issues with food addiction. And because of his food addiction, he had gained a lot of weight. That uh, weight started impairing his metabolism. So he ended up with diabetes. He ended up with hypertension. He ended up with his severe problem of his weight. And uh, the doctors tried to manage this with multiple medications. They gave him two medications for his blood pressure, and still his blood pressure was too high, even with two medications. Uh, he is uh, weighing 381 pounds, and he feels tired, uh, he feels foggy, his head. And he comes to our lifestyle program of 18 days. Again, the website is newstart.com. And in those 18 days, what we did, we put him on a plant-based diet, we deal with his exercise, stresses, and addictions. And in a matter of 18 days, his blood pressure had come down to normal levels. In fact, we had to stop his blood pressure medication. He no longer needed that blood pressure medication. His glucose levels in fasting came down to acceptable levels we had to stop his diabetes medication. Now, when he finished and improved this tremendously after losing 16 pounds, he didn't say, ooh, I'm going back to my old addictive foods. No, he learned his lesson, and at home, he continued practicing that whole foods plant-based diet. In a matter of six months, he already had lost 83 pounds. He continues to see his family medicine doctor, and he doesn't need either blood pressure medication or diabetes medication. He is under control. He continues doing the changes. In a matter of 11 months, he already has lost 111 pounds. And in a matter of uh, almost a year, when we do complete uh, blood test, everything is exactly the way we like it. His um, blood pressure is normal. His uh, cholesterol, exactly where we want it. Studies show that most heart attacks happen on people with cholesterols around 170, 180. Watch out. Your goal should be 150 or under, that should be the, the goal of your total cholesterol. His bad cholesterol, the LDL, 61, wonderful. We want the cholesterol of our patients to be under 75. That should be the goal for the LDL cholesterol. You can see also his prostate exam also improved, but the most surprising number is this one what is called the hemoglobin A1C. This number of 5.5 on somebody that does not take diabetes medication, it means his diabetes reverse. He is no longer a diabetic. Now, this is not, you know, in 28 years that I've been involved in lifestyle centers, this is not like, wow, you know, this is the only one I've seen like that. No, do we see this all the time? Every single program, we see people that improve like this. And you can see, after uh, 13 months, he has lost 139 pounds. And a year and a half later, um, after losing 141 pounds, you can see the difference. No longer obese, no longer diabetic, no longer hypertensive, and even as a bonus, his prostate exam also even improved. You no, know, things started working much better. So one of the keys at helping this person improve his problem was to 
conquer those food addictions. So what exactly happened to him? Well, if you look on a cell, one of the problems with the diabetic is that they start to accumulate these yellow things are representing fat. The diabetic tends to accumulate fat inside their cells. Is that going to be good or bad? Bad, because that fat starts to create oxidation and start to create oxygen-free radicals. It's making you age faster. That's why a diabetic needs to start making those right choices because we want to eliminate that. So how do you eliminate that fat from there? Well, first thing, whole food, plant-based diet, ideally without any oil. Doctor, but olive oil, what about olive oil? No olive oil. <laughs> no oil. In that way, as you stop pouring in fats, your body is able to start removing that fat inside the cell. Not only that, cells have these receptors are called these things here. And these receptors are not permanent. These receptors uh, vary depending on the situation. If your cell is very hungry, it will put out a lot of these receptors. But if the cell is not hungry, you're just sitting down the whole day and, and so forth, the cell is not hungry, therefore only few of these receptors are going to be expressed. And in fact, if we manage to express many more of those receptors, it means that cell is going to pull more of that glucose circulating in your blood, and that actually is what helps lower that fasting glucose. Because that glucose is not only circulating around, but it's actually going inside the cells. Now, I have never seen in my 28 years of experience somebody reversing their a diabetes on another diet than the whole food plant-based diet. See, if you're uh, taking things like dairy, dairy are loaded with fat. Therefore, you start interrupting this healing process. So, there have been multiple studies that have been done regarding how that plant-based diet can help improve the glucose on those people that follow it. Like in this study, they were comparing the American um, Diabetic Association diet against that whole food plant-based diet. It does make a big difference as you continue following that diet in your possibility of reversing your diabetes. In fact, the hemoglobin A1C, remember the one I was mentioning, the one that, that the patient, uh, it became 5.5? Uh, when you follow that whole food, plant-based diet, you can see the improvement is much more compared to the usual uh, uh, animal and so forth based diet. So one of the issues with food addictions is the following. It's like a smoker. Have you ever seen somebody that used to smoke and then suddenly stop smoking? How do they feel? Man, they feel really good, isn't it? <laughs> they feel really bad. See, because that cigarette used to give them pleasure and pleasure starts to stimulate that dopamine in their brains, and then suddenly, there's no longer that cigarette. Man, the dopamine crashes in their brain, and they feel horrible. Yet, do they need to start smoking again? No. They need to 
tougher it out, they need to continue without that cigarette, and then the brain will start to change, and the brain will get used to no longer receiving that nicotine, and then things will improve. Did you know that is exactly what happens in our lifestyle program? See, because I've worked for so many years in these lifestyle programs, I've seen this over and over. Classic story. Patient comes, and then we take away their addictive foods. And how do you think they feel? They don't feel good. <laughs> in fact, in, in our depression program, uh, we actually make him sign a paper that says, if you quit in the middle of the program, we won't return a single penny to you. Because we know that they're going to go through that stage. And as we take away those addictive things, the patient is not feeling good, and we need to encourage him and so forth. Well, that's why we give him massage and hydrotherapy and uh, uh, TLC, you know, and so forth to help them go through that difficult time that they're going. But I can tell you, after four, five, six days, man, the patient starts feeling so good. In fact, recently I had a patient that got really upset. And I told him, why are you upset? I'm upset at my doctor. How come my doctor never told me about this? You know, <laughs> I feel so good, you know. <laughs> Because the patient is able to overcome that addiction. Now, some people say, oh, a doctor, but everything is addictive. No, everything is not addictive. i never seen a patient addicted to broccoli, for example. You know? <laughs> they tell me, hey, you know, I didn't need my broccoli. You know, I'm, I'm getting nervous. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get a headache. I'm, I'm going to be able to sleep well. You know? <laughs> no, because broccoli is not addictive. But see... In the food industry, there are psychologists and they are food engineers, which are in a laboratory experimenting, you know, with people and with animals, finding those addictive foods and even making them more addictive. They need to have the right crunch and the right color that entices you because they know there's a lot of money there. If they hook you to those things, they know you're going to come back and come back and come back and come back. And they will make a lot of money. But dopamine is the issue. But not only the dopamine, something that has been documented is that dopamine gives you that tremendous pleasure. And you know, on the things that are very addictive, you see things like food, sex, love, but even friendship and novelty. See, there's a reason why you have that dopamine system in your brain. God designed it like that. So that you could enjoy the good things of life. You know, uh, sitting down and reading a good book, um, having a good conversation with a good friend of yours, enjoying a beautiful sunset and so forth. See, those things can give pleasure and it's good. We're not talking about being a masochist and not experiencing any pleasure at all. No, you know, that's not that's pathological. That's not normal. But the problem with these other super stimulating types of foods and things is that they overdrive the dopamine system. And you end up experiencing pleasure much higher than what your brain was used to experience it. And you can see this if you uh, work uh, with people, for example, that use uh, alcohol. See, the first time they take alcohol, that shoot their dopamine system. And it was this pleasurable sensation that they, that they found after taking that. So what are they going to do? 
they want to try to repeat that. But the next time you take it, it's not going to go as high as that. It will go high, but not as high. And it continues to be like that until you come to the point of those people that, uh, you know, they, um, they drink in the weekends. And then, you know, they need to go to work in the week, so they no longer are, are, are drinking. And they are literally miserable the, the whole week. And what are they talking about the whole week? Oh, this weekend, you know, when we go out, you know, <laughs> we're going to be drinking and so forth. Because their brains now are crashing. And they have under normal levels of dopamine. And, you know, they're going to be drinking not even for pleasure, but they're going to be drinking just to feel normal. Their dopamine is going to be so low that when they drink, it's not longer pleasure, but normal. Something that if you don't drink, you experience all the time. Fabulous, isn't it? <laughs> so that reward system helps us to put things into priority. See, if we didn't have that system, we could be working and working and working, we would forget about eating, we would forget about friends, we would forget about uh, going to bed, and our life would be totally out of control. But you know, as you are working in the morning and so forth, it comes a point that you start feeling like hungry and, and, and so forth. See, is that dopamine system being activated, reminding you that you need to eat? Which is good. You know, you need to eat. And as you eat good foods, you also experience pleasure. But not that excessively high pleasure that those overloaded foods have. So, we have that so that we don't forget about that. Now, there is a fascinating uh, discovery that was done recently. See... The reason why not everybody, for example, that drinks alcohol becomes an alcoholic, as you're aware of, is because there are some brains that have issues with their dopamine receptors. There are people that have less dopamine receptors than others. This subgroup of people are the people that are prone not only to alcoholism, but any type of addictions. What's happening to that brain? Well, because there's less receptors of dopamine. In order to get the same pleasure as this one that had more, it means they need a higher amount of dopamine. Therefore, those people cannot just eat one um, French fry. You know, they need to eat two, three things, you know, in order to get the same pleasure. Somebody would just eat one and say, okay, th th that's enough. See, these people have problems with those breaks. So as those dopamine um, receptors are less on those brains, those people are at higher risk for all kinds of addictions. And statistics say, depending how you measure and so forth, between 12 to 40% of adults here in the US have less of those dopamine receptors. And those, that subgroup of people are going to be the ones more prone to become a smoker, an alcoholic, drug user, um, compulsive type of gambling, overeating, and all these behaviors in which they're trying to overdrive that dopamine system. But that doesn't mean that they are destined to do these things. What we need is a reorganization of our brain. So it is interesting that even those people that have less 
dopamine receptors in the brain that tend to overeat, tend to choose the wrong types of foods. Studies show that even those people can benefit from the whole food plant-based diet. In other words, that same therapeutic diet can also bring healing in their bodies. In fact, in this uh, study that what, what was done among blacks, they were showing how people that have those less dopamine receptors in their brain tend to choose the wrong types of food. They tend to eat more fat, they tend to eat more sugar, and so forth, and that is also reflected on their markers. Therefore, they end up gaining more weight compared to those that don't have, you know, that problem. Their cholesterol tends to be higher compared to those and so forth, as those things end up having consequences. And you can see a little bit similarity. It's not only for blacks, but also on white population. And even those people that have those less receptors, it is expected that they're going to have a higher hemoglobin A1C if they happen to be diabetic. They're going to be less under control with their diabetes. But even them, the whole food, plant-based diet is able to lower their uh, hemoglobin A1C as they start now making their new choices. And same thing happens, uh, blacks or white population. And those um, um, less receptors are what makes people prone to overeat. And now, you already have an issue about overeating, and now we add all these highly addictive foods. Man, it's not a good combination. But can a smoker stop smoking, yes or no? Yes, a smoker can stop smoking. In the same way, somebody with these food addictions also can conquer that problem. So, what type of foods can be addictive? Let me show you an interesting experiment. I don't suggest you do it, but just listen to it. <laughs> if you have a little baby, nine to 12 uh, weeks of age, and you put yourself in front of that baby, and then you add uh, in a cup of, of water, you add one tablespoon of sugar, and then you mix that, and then you put the pacifier inside that, uh, uh, sweet water, and then you put that pacifier in the mouth of that baby, the baby is going to be hypnotized, you know, you know, say, wow, this stuff is good, <laughs> having all this pleasure, uh, dopamine kicking in in his brain. What happened to him? Well, that sugar stimulated those dopamine uh, receptors in his brain. And this is not just uh, uh, one particular baby. Any baby that you do that, you're going to get the same result, except people, uh, babies that come from mothers that have been addicted to opioids, if you do that to these babies, that doesn't happen to those babies. Why is that? Because those babies are used to tremendous amounts of dopamine. See, the drugs that the mother was injecting not only was affecting the mother's brain, but was actually affecting the baby's brain. And he was actually stimulating that. So, businessmen have figured out that they can not only hypnotize babies, but adults also. <laughs> and that's why they, in those laboratories, start designing all these highly addictive foods. And 
Yes, it makes people crazy. And the problem is that sugar is added to all kinds of things because they know that the person will get hooked to them and will come back over and over for a bigger dosage. And in fact, we live in a sick society in which um, in the old days, at least the portions used to be smaller. But as time goes by, you can see the sizes, you know, of the soda drinks and all these things, just tremendous amounts of sugar. And then you add something even more addictive, which is caffeine, and that doesn't help it. You know, in lifestyle medicine, there is a principle that says the following. If something is addictive, it's not good for you. So, what about coffee? Is that addictive? If you take coffee on a regular basis, and then you stop the coffee, do you feel great? In fact, Bristol University from the UK did a study. And the conclusion was that the person drinks coffee not because it gives them energy, but because, in their words, it avoids the chemotherapy side effect of not taking coffee. In other words, the person that stops the coffee is going to feel like they just put a bunch of chemotherapy in their veins. That's the reason why the person keeps going back and back and back. Again, if something is addictive, it's not good for you. And even you know that, you know? For example, tell me which one is the addictive foods, you know? It's not, it's not gonna be the lettuce, isn't it? <laughs> it's not gonna be the apple, you know? <laughs> but what about this, you know? What about this, you know? What about this, you know? Again, see, this is why even the businessmen know that. And when you go to the market, they're going to put you these foods here at eye level. You don't have to go, you know, down to get the chocolate, you know. It's here in front of your eyes. They even know how to entice you and get you as you go to the store. Now, in the emergency department all over America, we have this uh, medication called Narcan or naloxone is the generic name. And, you know, things like uh, morphine and heroin and these type of things, when you take this, um, the, the morphine, one of the nasty side effects that can have is that it stops your breathing mechanism. So the people that overdose with... Uh, uh, opioids, that's usually the reason why they die. They, they cannot breathe. You know? It paralyzes the, the, the breathing mechanism. So when somebody with uh, overdose comes to the emergency department, what we do, we inject this Narcan. And man, this thing works like magic. Here is this person, you know, couldn't even breathe. You put that there. They're able to breathe again because the Narcan goes to the opioid receptors and it blocks them. You know? So then uh, the medication is blocking them so that the morphine is not going there and doing its effect. Now you can do some very interesting experiments regarding that Narcan. For example, um, chocolate. Chocolate, they don't even, they don't call it the, a drug, they call them the drugstore. <laughs> it's multiple things, you know. In chocolate, you have caffeine. In chocolate, you have theobromine. If you look uh, uh, in a veterinary book, it's going to tell you there, don't give chocolate to your dog. Have you ever heard that? The theobromine will kill your dog. That's why you shouldn't give chocolate to your dog. Now, how come it doesn't kill you? Well, because your liver 
keeper works a little bit more efficient in the human than in the, than in the dog, and your liver is able to disintoxicate some of that theobromin. And then you have um, that phenylethylamine also that has a negative effect at the level of your brain. And then uh, usually they ask me, doctor, but what about uh, organic coffee? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it still has the caffeine, the theobromine, and so forth. So the cheese also stimulate those opioid receptors. In fact, this is very funny. In the lifestyle center, you know, as people come and, and, and we start stopping all their addictive things, if you ask the people, you know, from all the things that we took away, we took away your coffee, we took away wine, you took away uh, the meat and so forth, which one is the one that you miss the most? Which one is the answer? Cheese. cheese. Oh, man, how I miss my cheese. Well, this is the funny thing. The reason why you think you like uh, cheese so much is because cheese stimulates your opioid receptors. Exactly the same receptors that your um, um, heroin and, 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 and so forth stimulate. Now, it's not as powerful, but still is the same receptors. So that's why when you stop eating these addictive foods, I have had some people that say, doctor, my problem is that I don't think I'm designed to eat the whole food plant-based diet. I feel very bad. Well, the problem is that you're stopping these addictive foods. Therefore, you're not going to feel good. But it's like a smoker. What do you need to do? You need to stop using it, and then you're going to be able to overcome that. But here's the funny thing. If I give you a piece of chocolate, if I give you uh, a candy full of sugar, if I give you uh, a cheese, you know, the melty type and, and, and so forth, and I inject you Narcan, you know that medication that I told you for the people with the overdose? If I inject you that Narcan and I give you those foods, you won't need them. You'll take a bite out of chocolate and you'll put it down. Mm, I don't like it, you know. You'll take a bite of your cheese and say, no, I don't want it. Because it's not going to give you pleasure. See? <laughs> Fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> at, at the end, I'll have some Narcan selling it. <laughs> no. <laughs> so... The cheese has these casomorphins. See, there's a reason why God put those casomorphins there. So that when the baby drank that mother's meal, which is good, and that's exactly what you need to be feeding your baby, your baby is going to get hooked to it, which is good. He needs to seek that milk over and over again. But you know, the issue is that we human beings are the only species that continues using that milk even though they're old. You know? The cow stops eating, you know, the, the dog stops, the, the cat stops, but we human keeps on taking it. Now, the problem is that these casomorphins are different actually. If you see, for example, the bovine and the human, they are similar but a little bit different in a few amino acids. So that means you get as hook as you used to be with your mother's milk, you also get hooked with the one from the cows. And one of the problems with cheese is that it tends to be loaded with fat. Now, you can put fats in a liquid form, and that's going to give you a hint what type of fat it is. Polyunsaturated fats tend to be liquid 
at room temperature. Saturated fats, how are they? Solid at room temperature. Now, 70% of cheese is fat. Now, is cheese liquid or is cheese solid? Solid, which means what type of fat is it? Saturated fat, exactly the type of fat that, as the saying says, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. You know? Is the one that stimulates the weight gain. Is the one that stimulates your LDL and your cholesterol to go up. And not only fat is the problem, the problem is also the cholesterol. Because cholesterol stimulates inflammation in your body. We'll be talking a little bit more about that in a minute, about inflammation. So let me show you an interesting statistic. They were studying cow's milk and human's milk regarding cholesterol. Which one has higher cholesterol, cow's milk or human, human's milk? Human milk actually has more cholesterol than milk. But here's the issue. Cholesterol that is exposed to air oxidizes and is the cholesterol that damages your arteries, your blood vessels, that causes the heart disease, the strokes, and so forth. Now, the baby, how does he drink the milk? He drinks it straight from the breast of the mother. No time for that um, milk to be exposed to the air. No oxidation of the cholesterol. Absolutely no damage to the blood vessels of that baby. But what happens with the cow's milk? We take it out, isn't it? We oxidize it, and then you drink it. You know? In fact, some even put sugar to it, which even oxidizes further than that. So that means that if you want to drink cow's milk without oxidation, what do you need to do? <laughs> you need to hang from there. You know? <laughs> of course, you know, because of... <laughs> health issues, you know, may not be the, <laughs> the best thing to do. <laughs> so what is that concept of inflammation? Let's uh, uh, briefly review that. Inflammation is something that the first physicians from the first century, Dr. Celsus, for example, documented. And he realized that any time the, in, the tissue got injured, your body would respond with inflammation, which is heat, things get warm, you know, the skin gets warm, pain, redness, and swelling. For example, remember the last time you sprained your ankle? Did it hurt? Did it get red? <laughs> Did it get swollen? <laughs> See, there was inflammation. Remember last time you were cooking and you lift the pot and then the steam came out and burned you. What happened? It got red, it got painful, it got swollen. Any time you injure your tissues, your body will respond with inflammation. So you have those four symptoms. Calor, rubor, tumor, dolor in the Latin. And then... Um, Dr. Bircho added a fifth one, which is called functional lasse, which means you lose, lose the ability to use it many times it's temporary. For example, when you sprained your ankle, you couldn't walk on it, remember? Because of that fifth symptom. So Dr. Bircho from Germany realized something. He realized that most of the diseases that we see actually have their origin at inflammation. In other words, atherosclerosis, heart disease, stroke, even things like diabetes, cancer, and all these things, the common origin is an inflammation that took place too long. And this is a problem. 
like in this uh, book that I have, it says that inflammation, chronic inflammation, is going to be triggered by the lifestyle that you have, and that's going to give you chronic disease. But then what's the next line that this says there? The what link? That's exactly the problem. See, many people have tremendous levels of chronic inflammation, long-term inflammation, and they don't realize it because it's silent. Other than you feel tired, other than fogginess in your head, uh, low energy levels, and so forth, you think that everything is fine. And that's what I see in medical consultation. Patient comes, I do complete um, clinical history, I do a physical exam, I take blood tests, and when I am seeing things there, I realize that person has chronic inflammation. And I tell them, look, we need to make some lifestyle changes. And what do they say, some of them? No. Changes? No, I don't need to. I feel good. Why should I make changes? But what they don't realize, that that chronic inflammation is literally destroying their bodies. What analogy you see here with inflammation? What are they doing an analogy with? What do you see there? Fire. Is it a good idea to play with fire? <laughs> no, because you will get burned sooner or later. That's why Time Magazine ran a whole issue, and it calls it the what kind of killer? Secret killer. Most of the people in America, if you go and check, you know, the death certificate, you can trace many of those diseases to silent chronic inflammation. And those fires within you are going to burn you. This is like the way that I like to explain this concept to my patient. Is as a fireplace. You know, if you live here in Chicago, you know, the winters here are pretty brutal. So you better have some sort of heat, isn't it? <laughs> now you cannot survive here. So the fireplace is nice because it keeps the house warm. You know, it makes things livable and so forth. Even if you have the fireplace, even gives you a cozy type of, you know, effect there in, in that in building. But that is acute inflammation, short-term inflammation. When you sprain your ankle, when you burn your skin, that inflammation is helping the healing process. But let me ask you this. What would happen if the fire that is supposed to be inside of there starts coming outside. What's going to be the result? Disaster is going to be the result. And that is exactly what the choices of many are doing. See, this is the issue. There are things that we do that trigger inflammation. And if you keep doing that, you're just going to be feeding that fire. What things, doctor? Well, things like cigarette smoking, very inflammatory to the body. Things like alcohol, tremendously inflammatory. Doctor, but I heard that wine is good for my heart. Look, you heard that from the marketing department. <laughs> but the reality is another one. Any time you take alcohol, you create inflammation in the body. It's like your fireplace. What happens if I put too much wood there and I keep putting wood and wood and wood? Sooner or later, the fires are going to start creeping out. And what's going to be the result? Disaster is going to be the result of that. Excess sunlight. How do you know if you have excess sunlight? Did it get red? <laughs> Did it get swollen? <laughs> Did it hurt? <laughs> Watch out. Sunlight is a blessing, but too much is inflammatory. So if you work outside, make sure you're protecting your skin. 
excess body weight, tremendously inflammatory. Now, that's bad news, good news. That's the bad news. The good news is as soon as you start losing weight, the inflammation goes down. So use that as a motivation to get yourself on your normal body weight. Animal products. Any animal product will trigger inflammation in the body. So how does it do that? Well, cheese, eggs, um, uh, chicken, uh, beef. What happens with those foods, and also, by the way, white flour and sugar, they are too high in something that is called arachidonic acid. So arachidonic acid triggers the process of inflammation in your body. See, your cells have arachidonic acid inside the cell. So the reason why when you sprain your ankle, your ankle, boom, got all swollen, was because cells broke. And as they broke, they released the arachidonic acid and that triggered the process of inflammation. But when you eat these foods, like animal products, anytime you eat them, you end up turning on the inflammatory process even though you were not necessarily injured. Can you see the point here? We're putting too much wood on the fireplace. And in that way, it's triggering inflammation. How fast this happens? In a matter of minutes after eating those inflammatory foods, the inflammation in your body turns on. So notice this, for example, interesting study. This is the latest one from the American Heart Association. What are the causes of, that are triggering early deaths in America? Please notice that almost every single one of them triggers inflammation. So you have high body mass, excess body weight, we talked about that. Tobacco, we talked about that. Dietary, we talked about that. Uh, high fasting plasma glucose, we talked about that. You know, uh, when the sugar is too high. High blood pressure, we talked about that. Drug use, we talked about that. Alcohol, we talked about that. High LDL, we talked about that. Impaired kidney function, it could, it could not be, uh, related to inflammation. Occupational risk, not, not related to inflammation, but air pollution related to inflammation. Can you see? That is what's killing the Americans, inflammation. So is inflammation important? is something that we need to understand so we can avoid it in our bodies. So what other things can trigger inflammation? Not sleeping enough. You need to make sure you are sleeping at least seven hours. If not, inflammation is being turned on in the body. What other things? Alcohol, we're talking about this, you know, alcohol stimulates the inflammatory pathways in the body. So think about it. Day by day, that cup uh, of alcohol, man, you're just putting wood and wood and wood on the fireplace. That's not going to end up very pretty. Look at this one. Sugar triggers inflammation on the body. Also, this very interesting study, they gave sugar and then they gave anti-inflammatories in this study. See, the anti-inflammatories couldn't stop the inflammation caused by the sugar. So that's why in the first step, you need to cut it off. Now this one also, how seeding too much can trigger inflammation. But this is the interesting thing. If you're sitting down to do something 
useful is less inflammation as if you're sitting down just to watch TV or stuff like that. Very interesting. We still don't understand very well how this works. But there is also not only the sitting, but what you're doing while sitting down. This one, the trans fats, beware of these ones. You know, um, these are oils that have been heated. They trigger inflammation in the body. And this one also, a very important one, um, uh, gingivitis. I know you don't like doc dentists. I don't like dentists, but we need them. <laughs> you need to deal with your mouth problem because that gingivitis is triggering chronic inflammation in your body. You can end up with heart disease. You can end up with cancer and many different problems if you don't deal with that problem in your mouth. So you can test this in the laboratory. I'm not saying that you should do it or that it's nice, but I'm just documenting what has been done. For example, you can get alcohol. You choose the beverage of your choice, let's say wine. You take wine and you put it on a little paintbrush, paintbrush, and you paint the skin of the mice many times in the day, in a matter of a few weeks, you will see that that mice will end up developing a cancer. Why did that happen? And the answer starts with an I. Inflammation. You trigger inflammation that may changes to the cells and you end up with something serious like a cancer. And not only cancer, but also dementia. See, our understanding of dementia is the following. Inflammation in the body will trigger something that is called the APP. And when the APP is triggered, destruction of the... Um, of the connections in your brain take place. Is that good or bad? Bad. In other words, every time you trigger inflammation in your body, you are losing connections in your brain. That is not good. I don't know you, but I want to keep as many as possible there. You know, that's what is called the cognitive reserve, what's going to help you overcome as years go by, dementia and these type of problems. And Western style diet actually is not the best thing for you. You can actually find this one on my Twitter. I just put it there a couple of days ago. How Western style diet, what happens to the brain? It impairs the brain function, your ability to think straight and so forth. And this one also, you know, how stress has a negative effect on inflammation. So that's why we need to be careful how we manage our stress because chronic stress can trigger chronic inflammation. And that's the issue, you know. The um, markers in the, in the body, such as the TNF-alpha and the IL-6, those things, when they turn on, it means that inflammation is taking place. Now, look at uh, this one. In this study, they were finding out how your happiness, your ability to be happy, is impaired on people that have inflammation. So not only you affect your body, but it also affects your mood. Somebody with chronic inflammation has problems being happy. And notice this very interesting study, how attending religious services on a regular basis actually helps with your immune system decreasing inflammation. Fascinating, isn't it? <laughs> As you, you know, interact with others and the stress level goes down and so forth, that is actually 
good for decreasing inflammation. So, in closing, this is the way I like to tell my patients. Your uh, body is like a boat. So, from your parents, you're going to inherit what type of quality of wood your, your boat will be made of, you know? Um, and um, that is something that each one of us is, is different. But how we are taking care of our boat will determine if our boat is going to sink early or if it's going to last. For example, um, in the early years, what type of diet are you following? What type of stress are you being faced with? Are you sleeping enough? Do you have problems with your weight? Are you having insulin resistance, diabetes? Are you having high blood pressure? These things start weakening your boat. And cracks start to form in your material. And if you don't correct this, those cracks are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then water is going to start sipping in. And it's going to come to a point that there's too much water. You cannot reverse this. And the thing is going to sink early. So the famous uh, gene for, for dementia I don't know if you have heard about this APOE4 gene. It is a gene of inflammation. In other words, if you have that APOE4, it means something small creates tremendous inflammation in your body. That's what that gene does, and that's why it increases your risk of dementia. And in this study, you can see, for example, things that increase your risk of cancer. Number one here is tobacco, but you can look at this one. This is diet. It's even more inflammatory than the cigarettes. And then you have here obesity. So those are the top three triggers of obesity. This is uh, my study. This is a big sample uh, I use in this study 6,795 uh, 6, people. And what we were doing in this study, we were trying to see what effect does different methods of relaxation have regarding the uh, levels of stress. And this is what we found out. We found out that the most efficient way of dealing with stress is actually this one. Very interesting, you know. Big sample, 6,000 people, tremendously effective at helping people deal with their stress. So, in order to break from those food addictions, what are we going to do? Well, we want to start our day with a nice big breakfast. If you are hungry, you're just making yourself prone to fall into one of these wrong choices. You're going to see those donuts and say, hey, you know, I'm very hungry. I better eat one. But if you eat your nice whole food type of breakfast, you're satisfied. Your temptation actually decreases. Also, use foods that help keep your blood glucose under control. Like what? Things with high fiber, things like, like legumes, they help you have your blood sugars under control. Use spiritual resources. When you feel that you're weak, you're going to fall, ask God for help, and He's going to give you the victory. And start breaking those craving cycles. You know, the first time is going to be harder. But the more you say no, the easier it's going to be continue to do it. Make sure you're doing your regular exercise and you're resting. Make sure you have good support around you. 
hang around people that have healthy habits. They will have a positive influence on you and take advantage of other stories, other people that conquer the problem. Listen to those stories. It's motivating to see that others were able to do it. So in closing, this is a study from Alcoholic Anonymous. You're familiar with Alcoholic Anonymous, isn't it? These people run these programs all over the world, and they have helped many people break their alcohol habit. So in this study, they divided people participating in Alcoholic Anonymous that had issues with alcohol into three groups. And what they did they divided those people in three, in three groups. The first group, they were reading these Alcoholic Anonymous prayers that they do in their program. The second one was they put people to read irrelevant news, which actually most of the news today is in a fall in that bracket. And then the third one, they were just doing passive viewing. And then what they did they analyze with a functional MRI their brains to see what effect this was having in their brains. So let me explain to you something. When somebody is having an issue with um, um, addictions, we have what we call the higher brain. And the higher brain where we have our will should be controlling our lower brain. That's what we call the top down. That's the way you conquer an addiction. Even though I feel like using it, I say, no, this is not good for me. I should not use that. That is what we call top down. But there's also what is called the bottom up. This is when somebody is having the addiction. And by the way, this is not only for alcohol, any addiction. Coffee, alcohol, uh, sugar, uh, cheese. The, the feeling is taking control and the top one is just running around, along, you know. It's not actually putting the control. So what they found out is that from those three groups, when they analyze the brain, which areas of the brain were being turned on, they found out that those people doing those prayers, actually, that was strengthening, that was activating the top-down mechanism. Is that going to be good or bad? Good, because it helped them say no to that particular addiction. So, in conclusion, they found out that that top-down mechanism was being activated on those people reading those AA prayers. Which prayer they were reading? We made the decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of our God as we understood Him. That was a simple prayer they were praying, yet it had tremendous effect at helping them overcome those addictions. So as you can see, there is hope for addictions. You can conquer that addiction. It's possible to do it. And that's why we're here, to give you that support and encouragement and helping you have that victorious life. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we are going to have a Q&A questions for those of you who would like to say, stay. Now, all that we do here, you heard it here, you have a group of people here who are really, really uh, supporting each other with those lifestyles. If you're the one and you want to join us, you're welcome anytime. We are doing this for the community because we want to do something to contribute to the community so that people can have a better life. Now, there are a few things I hope that you receive. Next weekend, we are having Dr. Tomislav Terzin. 
He is a professor at Alberta University in Canada, and he's geneticist, molecular biologist. He will be speaking Friday evening, 7 p.m., 11 on Saturday in the morning, and 2 p.m. We are going to have a free, free uh, uh, plant-based lunch, as we did today. Uh, he is going to touch the nature, very fascinating things about the nature. He is going to connect with the health, so you are welcome to come and invite your friends. It's all free. We are also going to have a free weight loss class, which is going to be intensive class in one day. It is going to be send, Sunday, April 26, plant-based, and it is going to be from 12.30 till 7 p.m. If you come here, you're going to get also free lunch and free dinner. It's a free class. You don't need to pay anything, but you're welcome to come if it's free weight loss class with Jennifer White. You can find her at Jennifer, uh, jenniferskitchen.com. Okay, then we, are, we started last Sunday. If you're struggling financially, it is a nine weeks uh, with Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace University, how to budget, how to make uh, changes with your finances. We start, there is a cost for this one. There is a cost. We started last Sunday. You can still join us every Sunday at 1 p.m. Every Sunday at 1 p.m. You're welcome to come. I just heard the word that he might be traveling in April. You might be traveling through Chicago. We are on a good position that it is, uh, uh, that many times this is where his flight connections are. So we are going to work uh, uh, with Dr. Ramirez. He might be with us in April. There is a slight possibility. So, so if you are not on our mailing list, while he starts with q and I'm going to bring you a, uh, uh, something that you can, if you want to be on our mailing list, so that we can have uh, your information to inform you about those events that they are going to be. Now. All of this is for free. It is free, and we will continue to make it free for you, even there is a certain cost for the church. I would like to give you, you're not obligated, it's your free will, a free will offering. If you want to put a check, write it to the Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist Church. If you want to give some donation, we appreciate it. If not, we are so happy that you're here with us. So I would like to ask now if they can collect the free will donation. Also, all of this was taped, and if you go to the Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist Church website, go there to the menu, and if you go to the, if you go to, oh man, I am out. I was just right there. If you go to video library, you are going to see all these seminars there. Thank you, and now, it is a time for question Q&A session. Just raise your hand. I'm going to bring this while I'll go to bring also other. Uh... So regarding inflammation, I understand that that deals for arthritis as well. Is there anything in plant-based that you need to stay away from? I mean, I understand the animal product. Yes, that's a good question. Among, on the plant-based side of things, you want to stay away, and this is the principle, of spices that are spicy. That's the principle, <laughs> okay? For example, things like black pepper are not the best thing for you, or even the white pepper. They, it is irritating, and if it irritates, it triggers inflammation. So you can use spices, you know, but if it's spicy, watch out for that. Okay. They're all welcome. That's, that's right. That's a theory that never been proven. So yes. Ginger is not irritating. So yeah, it's welcome. You know, it's good. <laughs> so basically, what you're saying is the, the, there's a lemon and honey drink that has cayenne pepper. This was to help you lose weight. Is you can incorrect? use the cayenne as long as it's not spicy. If you're using it just to give flavor, just it's so fine. It's, okay, so in other words, if it's burning you, like you don't 
don't take a whole teaspoon in your drink or whatever, but it's okay to use. This is, yeah, this is the principle that I tell my patients. Use the baby principle. If you give it to a baby and he cries, it's too spicy. <laughs> You're going to accuse me of child abuse, but it's a good principle. <laughs> is that sugar from the fruits, like uh, almost uh, everything is fructose? Fructose, it's uh, bad for inflammation. No, it's excellent for inflammation because that fruit is loaded with anti-inflammatory agents. That fructose is stick together with fiber, so it does not behave the same way that sugar does. Even bananas, yes. It, it, it doesn't matter for cholesterol, that's right. It doesn't have any effect, that's right. Some are saying that depending on your blood type, certain foods are not good for you. Good Related question. to the first question, is there any truth in that? No, that's actually a, 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 a false a theory that was dismissed a long time ago. It was this guy from Norway, he wrote that book, but there is absolutely no scientific evidence whatsoever to that. They, the scientific community complained to this guy and said, show us the data, the, the evidence. He said, oh, I'll show it to you soon. That was back in the year 2000. It's 2020, we still haven't heard from him. <laughs> so no, that, that, that's not a, a, a true theory. What about wheat flour and spelt and all that? Is, That's right. Is, just your comments about that. Good question. So this is the, the, the issue. You know, if you go to Europe, one of the things I liked in, in Europe are these bread uh, stores. Man, they're not just one bread. Man, there's all kinds of breads. Europeans have been built on bread. That, has, that was their staple food there, you know, every single day. You know, you cannot sit down and eat without eating bread in Europe. So if Europe was, if bread is as bad as they say, man, this guy would have been extinct by now. <laughs> Yet the majority of the people in America are Europeans, you know. So um, that's actually what I like to call it a distractor. You know, the main issue actually is animal products. Those we know very well are not good for you. There's plenty of evidence in the scientific literature about it. So is uh, gluten uh, harmful and bad for you? No, unless you have celiac disease or there's some people that have some sensitivity to, to gluten, then you better, you know, be away from that. We found among our patient population some people that, the, um, that they don't do good when they eat certain types of bread. And we found out, and also there's plenty of research, you can find that on my Twitter account, I put those, those type of studies, that the problem actually is not the gluten per se, but it actually is the glyphosate that they're using to raise the, 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 the thing. So many people are actually not gluten intolerant, but they are glyphosate intolerant. You know? So those people should be, you know, uh, be away from that. No, is the gluten in, in the, the, the glyphosate is an, um, something they add the farmers to, uh, to kill the weeds and so forth. Uh, where's the microphone? Here. What is your opinion on intermittent fasting? Yes, it is wonderful and highly encouraged. Now, there's many definitions of intermittent fasting. The one I personally have been using since 1997 is the two meals a day program. So I usually eat breakfast and then I eat my second meal, ideally, when I'm home around three or four, and that's it. I don't eat anything else until the next uh, uh, breakfast. You know? In that way, you are doing intermittent fasting on a long term. You can keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it. It works wonderful. It even saves you time. You know, if you just eat two times a day, 
You don't have to prepare a third meal and cook and clean and all these things. So it's a good, efficient way of using your time also. has all kinds of benefits. So yeah, highly encourage. We'll, we'll so, give you, go ahead. So uh, uh, trans fats obviously have been banned you know, from the food supply or whatever. But um, being a synthetic um, way of, of producing things. Um, there have been issues with uh, synthetic vitamins versus organic yes. you know, forms of it. Um, and uh, along that same line with the GMOs, um, having this foreign kind of um, uh, substance being, you know, introduced into the body. Um, so all of these things, synthetic chemicals, um, GMOs, what have you, is that having a, an uh, inflammation response for those foreign substances? Good, good question. So the issue there has to do with the way that things were raised. So GMOs, I personally don't like that they're messing around with these things. You know? Yet the research, the uh, information that is coming uh, out of that, it's kind of nebulous. Some are going to say it's absolutely harmless. Some are say they may be causing some problem. So again, it's nebulous. So that's why I like to call also those GMOs uh, distractors. You know, here are, it's nebulous. Man, it's not good. It could be good. It's bad. I try personally to avoid them as much as I can, but I'm not fanatic about it, you know. But this we know are for sure not good for you, you know. So... In a study, for example, that was uh, done uh, recently, um, they were trying to see how many cancers were actually triggered by, by things uh, such as uh, food addictives and, 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 and so forth. And they had a population of 100,000 people. From 100,000 people, about a handful only were able to be traced to these type of things. So again, it's, it's a minor type of thing. Animal products, that's a big one. I can show you plenty of research. If you go to my Twitter account, I just put an, uh, a study there a few days ago, how one cup of milk increases your breast cancer risk tremendously. You know, just one cup of milk. See, that is the problem. This one is distractor, may, may not be. But this one, for sure, we know that it's not the best thing for you. Doctor, I was wondering if you could please give us your opinion on using avocado oil, coconut oil, and honey in our cooking. Good. Okay. So, regarding oils, we don't need a lot of oils, free oils, okay? Um, in the old days, if you go, for example, to rural Asia, rural Africa, you see people, a little glimpse of how our ancestors used to live. Man, they're like working in the fields the whole day. They're carrying all this weight. They have tremendous needs of calories. So. Those people need higher amounts of, of calories in their diet. But what do we do here? Man, life is easy here. You know, you sit down and you click in a mouse and then you get a paycheck. You know, <laughs> life is very easy here. And our level of activity is very small. That's why when our patients come to our New Star program, we take away the oils. Where are you going to get the, the fats? Well, we eat them from the avocado, we eat them from the uh, nuts, we eat them from things like the olives and so forth. But the average person, they don't need those tremendous amounts of oils. And don't fry things. Frying things uh, creates a lot of oxidation and makes your food inflammatory and so forth. So what are you going to use for oil? Pam, you know, Pam spray, so that things don't stick to your, <laughs> to, to, to your pot, you know. And um, also, your skin will tell you if you're eating enough fats. If your skin 
starts to get too dry, watch out. That means uh, you're not taking enough oils. You need to somehow increase your intake, okay? But most people don't benefit from excess oils. Now, what oil are we gonna use? Well, one that we don't like, and there's actually plenty of research about that, is uh, saturated oils, okay? Saturated oils, because of their highly saturated form, will actually increase LDL and cholesterol. You can go to my Twitter account. I put it two weeks ago, that study, in which they, were, they did one of the best studies on coconut oil ever done. They took a bunch of published, all the published studies that have been done on coconut oil, and they put them together to see what the direction of this is going, and definitely showing how cholesterols are, are, are worsening, uh, how um, weight gain is increased, and, and, and so forth. So don't take, you know, that type of uh, saturated oils. If once in a while you eat, you know, some, you know, something sweet that you made with coconut oil, not that big deal, but I wouldn't be taking that as an everyday type of thing. Um, could you give us an example of um, an average breakfast that you have? And you, you mentioned intermittent fasting. That's right. Um, do you use a six hour or an eight hour window? Yeah, good question. Personally, I like to eat breakfast around 7.30 and my second meal around uh, uh, 3.30 or, or so. That's, that's, that's my window that I have, okay? And another important window is the last meal to the breakfast. For Alzheimer's prevention, research show that it needs to be 12 hours, okay? It's the last meal and the breakfast, okay? Now, what do I eat? I like variety, so I don't have like a set breakfast, but my breakfast is the most abundant meal of my day. So things sometimes, like if it's uh, with legumes, you know, uh, some beans and, and uh, salsa, tortillas, no wonderful breakfast that one, you know, if you're Latino. But uh, if you want the American type of breakfast, uh, nice uh, plate of uh, some uh, whole grain, uh, such as uh, rye or oats or, or, or so forth, oatmeal, um, and then uh, some plant uh, type of uh, milk, you know, almond milk, soy milk, uh, whatever, uh, some bread, uh, some chia seeds, uh, nuts, and some fruit. Man, that's a really good breakfast, you know? So that you, when you're doing the two meals a day, you need to remember the following. You need to eat enough because the calories you used to eat in three meals, now you're going to eat them in two meals. So you need to increase a little bit your calorie intake in order to last for, that, for those two meals. If, if a person is type 2 diabetic and they, they're on insulin, they end up taking such a large amount of insulin, can it make it so your pancreas can never recover? Can you still reverse it or is it, is it over? Really good question. That's an excellent question. And this is the issue, inflammation. When you have diabetes, your body starts through oxidation and inflammation, a process of self-destruction of your pancreas. So there is a certain window for the reversal of the diabetes. That's why you cannot say, mm, let's see, the, the next summer I'll start. No, you start today, you know, because it may be too late by then. So the possibility of reversal is directly related to how much insulin your pancreas still is able to do. Type 2 diabetes is going to go through two stages. First, you have the hyperinsulin stage. So the insulin is tremendously high at the beginning of the, the diabetes. The pancreas is generating a lot of insulin because there's a lot of insulin resistance in your whole body. Remember, because the fat that is accumulated inside the cells, the cell cannot work properly. And as time goes by, 
the function of the pancreas starts to decrease as inflammation is destroying that pancreas. And then it comes a point that it may need the help from external insulin because the pancreas is not working. But I have seen many cases of people that had to inject the insulin and were able to reverse it. So it depends on how much function that pancreas still has. So there's two possible tests you can do. One is insulin. There's a test to measure insulin of the pancreas. And there is a second test called the C-peptide. C-peptide tends to be actually cheaper than the insulin test, and it indirectly tells us how much function that pancreas has. So either one of those it has a, a predictive uh, effect of, of what's the possibility of reversing that type 2 diabetes. Um, you gave some guidelines general for cholesterol and um, LDL. That's right. Do you have anything, any su general suggestions for blood pressure, for the cholesterol HDL ratio? That's right. And um, the HDL, um, That's right. you know, guidelines. Okay. So this is the issue. Regarding uh, blood pressure, we want uh, blood pressure under 130, the, the first number, and the second number, uh, 90, 130, 90. We want anything under that, that's going to be the, 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 the best thing. Yes, it can. There are some people that are thin, and they tend to have low blood pressures, such as a 90 over 60, and they're still functioning fine. Okay. Now, what about the HDL? See, many uh, people don't realize the following. The cholesterols are related to inflammation. So when somebody starts changing to a whole food, plant-based diet, HDL sometimes can come down, and it's okay. Because the inflammation in the body is going down, the HDL is going to go down. There's some very good articles recently. The last one I put there, my Twitter was like six months ago, about how HDL is actually not that much important. HDL is important if you're not doing good in your diet, you better have a good HDL. But if you're having a whole food, plant-based diet, the importance of the HDL diminishes. Okay? We need to be concentrating more on the LDL and the total cholesterol. So that's why even the ratio of the HDL, LDL, which many make a big deal about it, is not that big of a deal once you are on the right program. Okay? Doctor, I've seen some research that says that magnesium stearate and titanium dioxide, which are like preservatives and different vitamins. That's I've right. actually seen them in my vitamins because I wasn't really paying attention. That's and right. they were good vitamins. That's right. uh, and it said it's supposed to affect the immune system in not so good ways. Are there particular preservatives that we should like really look out for so we're not overdoing it even right. though it's healthy? Yes. Yes. So many of those preservatives are not the best thing. That's why we don't like supplements very much. We actually don't. We use some, but not very much. We rather people get their uh, nutrients from real food. See, there was an interesting study that was done regarding smokers. And uh, smokers taking supplements actually had higher rates of cancer than smokers not taking the supplements. Somehow the supplements were triggering, you know, through some of these things, the, the, the inflammation and the cancer and so forth. But the way God put it there in the food, you know, you're able to get it and absorb it much better. So um, we use supplements when the, we can prove, you know, with a laboratory or something that there's a deficiency. You better go and, 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 and feel that need. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. America has one of the most expensive urine in the world. A lot of Americans, you know, taking all these supplements, they all go to your urine. And you're just making expensive urine. You know? <laughs> so, 
So, I was really <laughs> so avoid that. Yeah, does uh, autoimmune disease related with uh, uh, inflammation? With and autoimmune disease. Yes, right. Related with inflammation, and um, it is possible uh, to be to be reversible. Good disease. question. Yes, you can measure that. You know, when you have an autoimmune disease and you measure the markers of inflammation, there's a marker that is called, if you want to measure inflammation in the blood, is the um, ultra-sensitive C-reactive protein, or CPR. Sometimes it's, it's found like that. And there is another... Um, non-sensitive, that is called just C-reactive protein or CPR, that one is not as accurate as the ultra-sensitive C-reactive protein. So somebody with an autoimmune condition, man, those markers are like really, really hard. So what do you do for somebody with autoimmunity? Well, you deal with the inflammation you need. That, that, those people, it means that they're really close to the precipice. You know, you need to help them get off as back as possible. So many autoimmune conditions respond wonderful to these lifestyle changes. I've uh, observed this many times, you know, from rheumatoid arthritis to lupus and so forth. They respond wonderful to the autoimmune disease. One of the most famous cases of reversal of autoimmune condition that you see in the press is this famous tennis player, this Venus uh, lady, uh, the champion, Serene. And um, she had a, a Sjogren's disease in which the glands uh, stop uh, uh, working. So you have these dry eyes and dry mouth and uh, dry vagina and so forth. And with a whole food, plant-based diet, her disease went to remission. She, she doesn't have the problem. Hashimoto thyroiditis, you can stop it, but the problem is that once the gland is destroyed, what can you do? You know, the, 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 the gland cannot make any more thyroid. So you're going to need some external help with some uh, Synthroid or, or something else. Okay. So for the alter, um, fasting, yes. can you... It's better not to miss breakfast, is what you're saying. If you That's right. It's important to eat the breakfast. The breakfast is the most important meal. And yes, it needs to be early. Research says that you need to be eating your breakfast between three, uh, to, three to four hours after waking up. Okay? Maximum. Okay? If you eat it later than that, you start having some implications. Now, some people tell me, doctor, my problem is that I'm not hungry for breakfast. Well, you're not hungry for breakfast because you had a huge dinner, you know. You, your digestive tract was like working the whole night. So by the time the morning arrived, your body says, you know, forget it. Don't give me food. You know, I'm tired. So you want to have hunger <coughs> for breakfast? Well, don't eat that last meal. No more questions. Is there <laughs> any other question? <laughs> Okay, there is. Wow. <laughs> um, you mentioned the blood pressure. I noticed that the um, systolic, I think that's the top one in my blood pressure, a tremendous difference in numbers I get at different times. So I'll get anywhere from even below 110 up to 150. I mean, yeah. which one do you count? That's right. Yeah, well, what you need to do, you need to average it. You need to make sure you're using the same equipment, and ideally, you need to take it at the same time, okay? So, yes, it varies throughout the day. Also, there's things that affect blood pressure. One of them happens to be coffee, okay? Anytime you take coffee, your blood pressure is going to shoot up. That's one of the possible side effects. Not only it raises your blood pressure, it raises your blood sugar, also in the diabetic, the, the coffee. It eliminates your vitamin B from the body. It eliminates your calcium. It eliminates your iron. Again, it's a bad deal, you know? What you're getting out of it, you're getting worse than what you're actually putting there. So it's a, it's a big, it's a bad deal, you know, to be taking coffee. So watch out, you know, for, 
Anything that has caffeine can potentially increase that. Sleep can also increase blood pressure. If you didn't sleep good, most probability that your blood pressure will be up. If you haven't done exercise in a couple of days, that can uh, uh, increase blood pressure. If you are under a lot of stress and so forth, that will increase blood pressure. So it's multiple factors that are involved in, in blood pressure. So try to take it at the same time uh, over a period of uh, a week or so, and that's going to give you a better idea what's the real blood pressure. The microphone is there. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I usually enjoy a Hispanic breakfast like you do. Amen. But I have a huge <laughs> bottle of Cholula that I like to use liberally. And if you were to put a salsa on your beans with tortillas, would you use mild, medium, or hotter? What we use, actually, if you go on and see the real thing, it is a, a, a fresh type of salsa, which consists of the following. Tomato, cut in small pieces, onion, um, cilantro, and just a little bit of small piece of chili just to give flavor, not that it's spicy. That's a um, very good salsa you can do. Okay. <laughs> the best way to increase your tryptophan for the serotonin, remember we were talking about that yesterday, is with a whole food plant-based diet. This is the biochemistry of it. Tryptophan is what your body converts into serotonin. But animal sources of tryptophan not only has tryptophan, but it also has other amino acids that look like tryptophan, but they're not tryptophan. So when you're eating animal sources of tryptophan, you not only eat the amino acid, but all these competing amino acids. And actually, very little tryptophan actually makes it into your brain. And now you're putting competition, so even less tryptophan makes it into the brain. So it's what is called central tryptophan. That's the way they use it in the scientific literature, which is the amount of tryptophan you actually have in the brain. How to increase it? Whole food, plant-based diet. That's the best way to increase that tryptophan. That's right. No supplemented tryptophan. That's right. <laughs> um, things like gluten is loaded with tryptophan. Things like tofu. The king of the beans is the black eyed peas. That's the king of the, of the, of the, of the tryptophan. Brown rice is loaded also with, uh, with, with, with tryptophan. So, and uh, flaxseed also. Flaxseed and chia seed. Be behind you. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Well, he can hear me, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, with high blood pressure, uh, walking and stuff, should you wait a while before you take your blood pressure or... Because when it, uh, walking and stuff uh, right. make your blood pressure go higher? Yeah. Walking will increase temporarily your blood pressure. So, yes, you want to wait an hour or two to take the measurement so you can get a better accurate measurement. Okay, one other question. Type 1 diabetes. Yes. I know, you know, that's it. Your pancreas isn't working anymore. But isn't it better to use brown rice or, and I know legumes, are, but yet it throws up your blood sugar so high. So how do you relate to that? If someone wants white rice, can you say, well, no, maybe the brown rice would be better, or how yeah. do they deal with that? Yeah, the way you deal with that is that ideally those people should be eating brown rice. But if you're going to eat the white rice, you need to eat it with legumes. When you combine that with legumes, the legumes, the high fiber on the legumes, keep that blood sugar under control. So it needs to be a small portion and more legumes than the white rice in order to keep it under, under control. And especially the, the pre-cooked rice, the one that's in the package, man, that one has a tremendously high um, glycemic index. Watch out for that. But anytime you eat that, it's like potato. You can eat potato as long as you eat it with a high fiber food like legumes. 
foods, don't eat the potato just by itself, can trigger that uh, glucose very high. Okay? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just so, uh, Dr. Ramirez, it's four o'clock, he needs to eat his dinner. And <laughs> <laughs> He's traveling tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I truly, truly appreciate really so many informations. My prayer is also, actually I will actually pray at the end uh, that, that we would be able with God's help, with God's guidance to put some of those things into our lives so that we can be better, that we can be more happier and also uh, help the others who are. We also have, when you're going to leave, go, don't go directly through this door, door, go through the fellowship hall. There is a free, freshly made smoothie for you. So That's just go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is going to be your last meal. Exception. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. You can say amen. Or.